Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Good evening, this is Ronald Coleman. And Benita Coleman. Inviting you to join us again on the campus of Ivy College. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Surround us here today, and we will not forget, though we be far, far away. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president of Ivy, starts this week on his vacation, accompanied, even we say, by his charming wife, Victoria. And here in his administration building office, metaphorically putting up the shutters, cutting off the utilities, and stopping the milk delivery for the summer, we find Dr. Hall and his secretary, the indispensable Miss Goodson. Well, let's finish up, Miss Goodson, before we have another influx of bon voyage visitors and footloose professors. Now, is there anything else? Before I shoulder my knapsack and wander off through Bogan Fen? There are two letters to sign, Dr. Hall. Only two? That's splendid. <laughs> For me to get through the college year as a two-letter man is quite an achievement. Uh, which two are they? One of them is a personal note to Mr. Wolfe of Business Administration, who left us to go with an advertising agency in New York. And at three times the salary we could give him, I'm happy to say. With his energy and personality, he'll make a fine... Uh, uh, what is the term? Huckster. Uh, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Probably from the Middle English word huckle, meaning haunch. Because destiny seems to have shaped his ends for an executive chair. <laughs> uh, and the other letter? To Professor Alvin Weingand of the English Department, congratulating him on his new publication called... What's a good word? Ah, yes, a real contribution to the living language. Professor Weingand advocates a positive approach to popular usage. My mother always took a negative approach. She used to tell me always to remember that the only word which occurs naturally in the English alphabet is N-O. No. <laughs> well, I salute Mother Goodson. All right, now I'll sign the letters. Where is my, uh, my fountain pen? It's being repaired, sir, at that little side street shop in Ivy. Oh. You always say that while the proprietor may be slow, you rather like his nibs. <laughs> uh, one priceless witticism for a one-dollar repair job. It takes three weeks. <laughs> now, let me see the, the wolf letter. There we are. And the wine gand letter. That's that. And now what, Miss Goodson? That's all, sir. You're through. I'll take care of anything else that needs doing. Your traveler's checks, road maps, and motor club material are in this envelope. I hope you and Mrs. Hall have a lovely summer, sir. Thank you. And in this envelope, you will find a small contribution toward your summer, Miss Goodson. Thank you, sir. And I thank whatever powers may be who watch over college presidents for sending me such a flawless secretary. And now, will you call Mrs. Hall and tell her I'm on my way? She knows, sir. I called her while you were talking to Professor Heeslip. I said you'd be home in 45 minutes. You have a full 12 minutes to make it. Daddy, oh, you're home. Uh-huh. I hope you folded your overalls neatly and left your lunch bucket in the locker and punched the time clock right in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I even had Miss Goodson disconnect the electric clock in my office thus saving the college at least 11 cents in electricity over the summer. Uh, <laughs> this is an idea from far left field, but a stop clock somehow reminds me of Mr. Wilman. It does? Why? Because even a stopped clock is right twice a day in spite of itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, the observation isn't original with me, of course, but... Yeah, oh, speaking of time, aren't you home rather earlier than you'd hoped? Yes, and we'd have finished much sooner, except for several professors who dropped in to wish a happy summer. Oh, when Miss Goodson called, she said you were deep in conversation with Professor Heeslip. Deep is the proper term. Oh. Forty fathoms at least. Heeslip, as you know, fancies himself a Shakespearean scholar. And I suspect dreams of himself playing Hamlet in doublet and tights. 
Professor Heaslip in tights is not a dream, Toddy. It's a nightmare. <laughs> yes, and it's regrettable that with a voice like Sir Henry Irving, he should have a figure like, like Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> well, I'd have said Luke Costello, but between Greenstreet and Costello, you can split the difference. A- and also the tights. <laughs> <laughs> for Heaslip has a new parlor game, uh, designed, I think, for literary show-offs and intellectual snobs. I, um, <laughs> I did quite well at it. Well, go ahead, snob darling, and show off for me. What's the game? Well, I don't know that it has a name as yet, but it might be called Here's Your Hat and Quote. Um, (laughs) Or Block That Reference. The idea is that your opponent indicates a nearby object or suggests a brief situation, and you must counter immediately with a Shakespearean quotation, giving the sauce. Oh, you mean if, if, if you say he slip, I snap right back with... They have been at a great feast of languages and stolen the scraps. Love, labor, lost, act four. That's it, exactly. And very good, Vicky, if I may say so. Well, thank you. I'm all tuckered out now. <laughs> I must confess, I was quite carried away with the game. I'd like to hear you two play it sometime. Maybe I could enjoy seeing Professor Heaslip carried away. Give me some more samples. Well, I pointed to that plaster bust of myself that one of our art students made a few years ago. And Heaslip promptly said... Why should a man whose blood is warm within sit like his grandsire cut in alabaster? A merchant of Venice, Act One. Not bad. Then what did he give you? Well, he indicated a small puddle where the water cooler had leaked. So I said, great floods have flown from simple sources. All's well that ends well. That's brilliant, <laughs> darling. I bet you can beat Heaslip hands down at his own game. Well, my, my final triumph was a bit fraudulent, mm-hmm. I'm afraid. As he was leaving, he said, man bites dog. And I said, the, the biter bit, tis only just, it is a bitter bite. Coriolanus, Act Three. Well, it's marvelous. I, Coriolanus, I don't remember that line. <laughs> no, dear, I, I invented it for my own nefarious purposes. <laughs> <laughs> and Hisler didn't challenge it. He was obviously afraid it would expose his own ignorance. <laughs> But enough about that, my sweet. How have you occupied yourself today? Oh, packing, repacking, calling up about the lights and the gas and the water, cleaning out the refrigerator, and fighting bees. Bees in the refrigerator? Well, I must say you're a thrifty little help meat raising your own honey. <laughs> <laughs> Don't your bees get a trifle lethargic at freezing temperatures? They weren't my bees. Oh, borrowed bees. <laughs> well, it's a novel touch of neighborliness. I say, William, will you run next door to the Quincannons and borrow a cup of bees? Yo, William, the bees weren't in the refrigerator. Oh. They were swarming in that big old oak tree out in front, and a lot of them got into the house. And how did the beautiful and ingenious Mrs. Hall cope with the matter? Oh, the clever Mrs. Hall's first thought was to run screaming out of the back door. The second thought, the fly swatter. Third and best thought, our natural history department. And they sent a man over who lured them away with a queen bee. Girl crazy, hmm? <laughs> And after coming in the house and seeing you, Vicky, I can't blame them. Well, thank you. And I don't remember that Shakespeare said anything apropos of that situation. Oh, yes, he did. Yes. Midsummer Night's Dream. Lord, what bees these mortals fool. <laughs> There's a slight transposition necessary for you to understand. But yeah, you explain it to me yeah, sometime, you know. <laughs> Excuse me, darling. Uh, Dr. Hall speaking. Hello, Professor Warren. Well, thank you, Joe. Well, I was a little hurt. A parade of professors through my office this afternoon, and no Joe Warren. But, but uh, uh, what are your plans, Professor? You are, and you got your license this afternoon. Good for you. Well, thank you for calling, and we'll see you next fall. Bye, Joe. Professor Warren, you got a license? What, not marriage? Uh, no, dear, fishing. Oh. <laughs> oh, he says he's going up into some remote part of Canada for the summer. I wonder why... What's the matter, darling? Well, it's just occurred to me that... Oh, well, they're, they're probably busy packing, too. Although it does seem that one or two of them might have... Uh, Oh, but maybe they tried, and I was too involved with Heaslip. Still... William, what on earth are you trying to say? Who might have tried to do what? Well, Vicky, do you realize that not a single student has called on me or telephoned to say goodbye or good luck? 
Oh, Tony, I don't really think that means anything. Did any of them call here while I was gone? Well, no, but... Well, uh... that's even stranger. They consider you practically one of them. I, being the president, might be considered too aloof to be the object of such intimacies, although I have tried to maintain a... a... Really, now, don't, don't, don't you think it odd? Well, yes. Oh, but, darling, maybe they don't realize we're leaving today. Well, Vicky, I mentioned it in chapel yesterday morning. Oh, well, <laughs> don't worry about it. My goodness, they all love you and you know it. Come on, now, now what did the other yes, William have to say about that? Uh, what, about falsely assuming a personal popularity? Well, now, let me see. Yes, yes, there's the speech in Measure for Measure. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured. His glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. of America is bringing you this presentation of The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Collins. As we return to The Halls of Ivy, we find Dr. Hall just coming back from loading the last suitcase, tennis racket, sunglasses, camp stove, and reading material into the car. I think that does it, Vicky. And from the looks of the back seat, the rear deck, and the glove compartment, we are thoroughly equipped for a three-year safari through darkest Wyoming. <laughs> Are you ready to leave? Yeah, I think so. Let me check my list again. Now, uh, then, um, let's see. 64, 66, 66. Item 67. 67? What, may I ask, is the total number of your memoranda? But in round numbers, 88. Oh. Those are about the roundest numbers I could think of, so I'll <laughs> leave there. But item 67 says, don't forget BB. What do you suppose I meant by that? B.B. Hmm. Hmm. Couldn't mean just B.B.'s because I'm not taking my air rifle. Hmm. <laughs> a bundle of blankets. Uh-uh. A box of biscuits. Uh-uh. Bread and butter. Uh-uh. Stop me if I'm getting warm. <laughs> Barrel of bicarbonate. Oh. <laughs> Eight for barracuda. Oh. Bank book. Yeah, that's it, thank you. Well, why do we need that? Considering that I've drawn practically all our available funds in the form of traveler's checks, the bank book would merely be an unhappy reminder of better days. Yes, not the bank book, Toddy. Your bird book. Oh. Do you remember last time we took a long trip and you'd see a uh, purple-billed swamp goonie or something? And you <laughs> you'd go something mad trying to identify it? Yes, yes, and thank you for remembering. Uh, where is the book? Oh, it's in the car. I loaded it first thing so I wouldn't forget. My darling, I don't know what I should do without you, and I hope I never find out. Well, is your uh, your list all checked off? Yes, I think that's everything. Now, if you will wait while I put on my face... Oh, wait, wait, I... wait, wait. Uh, did I hear the telephone? No, but if it had rung, you would have, because you're practically sitting on it. Hmm. Thought I felt it ring. Charlie, <laughs> <laughs> you're not so worrying about not hearing from the students. Well, no, no, not worrying exactly, but I do think it's strange that none of them called. Well, there's probably some very simple explanation, but we're both such complicated characters, we can't think of it. Well, last year, for instance, we were besieged by youngsters and their friendly farewells. William. I can't think what I may have done or not done. I would tried them now and then, yes, but I've also consulted them. William. And helped them. Toddy. Advised them. Darling. And to leave for the summer without a... Uh, yes, Vicky? Look. I won't consider spending the summer with a college president who's brooding about not being played off the campus with a string quartet. Oh, my love, it's not that. And I don't want to have you running out of gasoline because you forgot to fill the tank because you were wondering why the senior class didn't line up on the front porch to kiss us goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and if you're referring to the time we, or I rather, uh, ran out of gasoline in our little rented English car in Devon. Was it Devon? Oh, yes. What a lovely day it was to run out of petrol. But then you always thought of the nicest things to do. I still remember the red sandstone cliffs and the surf and the seagulls scolding us for the intro. Uh, 
Uh, Miss Cromwell? Yes, Mr. Hall? I am an American. My entire family were pioneer Americans. Mayflower. The, um, uh, revolution, if you'll pardon the reference. Uh, I am proud of my American heritage, but I regret to inform you that being unused to English automobiles with their smaller fuel capacity, we are out of gasoline. Oh, well, I don't think Parliament will call a special meeting about it. Besides, when you think that part of the Spanish Armada was wrecked near here after storms and scurvy and hunger... Why, running out of petrol seems a little trivial, doesn't it? Yes, particularly as we passed a village not two miles back. Uh, or is it kilometers? Or shillings? Oh, well, <laughs> let's just call it a brisk walk. May I come with you? May you? Oh, but I warn you, with you the walk will not be brisk. I shall prolong the journey to the point of dawdling. Well, you've known me so briefly that you probably don't realize that I'm a girl guide. You are? Yet with three merit badges for dawdling, sauntering, and meandering. <laughs> and I am an eagle scout who has just laid an egg as a motorist. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Crumble, will you do me the honor? <laughs> Miss Crumble, will you do me the honor of accompanying me to Yon Hamlet, whatever it might be called? Oh, I'd love to, Mr. Hall. And the name of the village is Appledore. Thank you, girl guide. You know, I still feel slightly apprehensive about leaving a car parked on what is to me the wrong side of the road. Do Americans ever get accustomed to using the left side of the street? Well, I think they rather enjoy it. Why, I've always heard that the American attitude toward oncoming traffic was, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, suppose we take a shortcut across this nice fat meadow. All right. Ah, what lovely country this is. Every part of your England seems to have its own particular brand of beauty. I imagine America does too. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, they say. <laughs> Why are you staring at me? Oh, I guess I'm just a beholder with beauty in my eyes. You are beautiful, you know. I never realized how rosy your cheeks were. Oh, well, you're looking at me through the rose-colored glasses of Devon. Why, everything around here is rosy. The cliffs, the apples, the deer, and well, even the sheep have a reddish tinge. Yes, and look at the fuchsias outside that cottage. Yes. I don't know how science accounts for this rosy aspect, but I have a theory which explains it to my satisfaction. Well, science is always so impersonal. I think I'm going to like your theory better. What is it? Well, my theory, to account for the local pinkness, is that your presence raises the blood pressure of the countryside to such an extent that the result is a breathtaking blush. Oh. Oh. Uh, did, did you say the name of that village is Applecheek? No, no. It's Apple Door. <laughs> and I must warn you, this part of the coast is to be taken very seriously. They say, from Padstow Point to Lundy Light is a watery grave by day or night. Yes, as witness the Spanish Armada. Yes. Uh, Miss Cromwell, uh, Victoria. Yes, William? Uh, do you, um, uh, do you think you would like America? Why? But, what an odd question. I'm sure I would, but why do you... Oh, oh just keep it in mind and, um, uh, think it over. I may have another question. A more or less related question to ask you on the... Telephone, darling. Uh, no, no, not on the telephone. Uh, darling, did you call me darling? Miss Crumble, are, are you... William, hurry! It's the telephone, on the phone. I've got a telephone ring way out here. Uh, oh, oh, the telephone. Uh, yes, I'm yes. sorry to bring you back from wherever you were, darling. You had such a blissful expression on your face. Well, I was in Devon with you. And the happier combination never existed, at least until you married me. Uh, maybe it's a student. Oh, Dr. Hall's residence. Yes. Who? Archie Scott of Sophomore. Yes. See what I tell you. Uh, oh, I see, Mr. Scott. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm making no further appointments. I'm leaving on my vacation, as I announced in chapel yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you, you've forgotten that. I, I see. Mm. Well, well, I'd suggest you see your faculty advisor. Yes. Goodbye. Well, no good luck and Godspeed? No, no. The young man wanted to consult me about a change of courses. He'd heard me announce our departure, but it has slipped his mind. Mind. I use the word so loosely, it is in danger of falling out of the sentence. <laughs> 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 Don't be bitter, Mr. Hall. 
Yes, oh, dear. Uh, here's your hat. Here are the keys to the car. And goodbye, number one faculty row. <laughs> Toddy, we're on our way. I wave goodbye to Wellman Hall. It won't wave back, but no Wellman has time for little frivolities. <laughs> I'm sorry, my darling. It was just the thought of departing without a friendly pat on the head from at least one student. William, look. What, what, what's going what on? The what? road's blocked oh. off ahead. Hey there. What's the matter? Something wrong? It's him. It's Dr. Hall. Yes, Dr. Hall, there is something wrong. What is it, Jimmy? What's wrong? Well, the art department was making up a beautiful scroll for us to wish you a wonderful summer and thanks for everything, but some idiot spilled a bottle of ink over it. We talked him out of shooting himself. I don't know why. But all we could do then was stop you on your way and say goodbye. Oh. Well, I... Well, well, thank you. Thank you all very much. You just kept Dr. Hall from shooting himself, too. <laughs> well, I haven't got a speech ready, Dr. Hall and Mrs. Hall, but speaking for everybody in this academy of yours, I can say we wish you a wonderfully happy vacation, and if you've got room for it among your luggage, you're taking the affectionate regards of everybody with you. Take care of yourselves, because we'll need you in September. May we sing you on your way, sir? Oh, you may indeed. And thank you again. Not too good now, or we may decide to stay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, the Ivy Alma Mater for a couple of friends. Oh, we William, didn't Shakespeare have a word about this? Oh, yes, my love, in the Tempest, remember? Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. Good night. The scripts in this play by Lee Patrick and Jimmy was Gil Stratton, Jr. Tonight's script was written by Don Quinn. 
Music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Ken Carpenter speaking. Oh, we love the halls of light that surround us here today. This production of the Halls of Ivy was broadcast with an actual audience present in the studio. We